last thoughts or pieces of advice you'd like to give for you know those listening that are interested in potentially uh, you know going down the same path that you you already went yeah so my advice to everyone who's listening is always have a never quit attitude um, throughout the entire process uh, whether you're applying to SAMS or thinking about applying to SAMS or even as you're going throughout your military career always have an attitude of I will never quit Welcome back to Leaders Recon. I'm your host, Joshua Carr, and today we're talking with Major O'Connell about SAMs. Um, but before we dive into the School of Advanced Military Studies, did I get that right? <laughs> um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about you. Obviously, you're a SAMs grad. Um, you know, what's an interesting fact um, about you before we dive into SAMs? Well, an interesting fact about me is uh, when I'm not wearing the uniform, working on plans and strategy in my civilian life, I'm a musician. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, I play a, a handful of instruments from the trumpet to the piano to guitar and bass. And throughout my life, I've played in about nine different bands, I think, oh, wow. uh, with styles ranging from rock to punk to heavy metal to everything in between. Are you playing so, in a band right now? Unfortunately, no. No, no okay, I, just, I, I don't say. have the time. But if anyone out there is listening and uh, would like to jam, yeah, just please hit me up. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> Um, so as we talk about SAMS a little bit, we talked a little bit before the podcast about, you know, the couple different programs that kind of are tiered related to this military studies. Can you give us an overview of what those programs are? Yes. So uh, SAMS, the School of Advanced Military Studies, includes three different programs. Uh, so the most common one is the Advanced Military Studies program. So that's uh, typically known as the majors program. Okay. It's, uh, it's completed uh, after uh, majors complete their uh, command general staff officer course or their equivalent intermediate level education. Uh, the second is the it's Advanced Strategic Leadership Studies Program, which is the Senior Service College course. Uh, that one is attended by uh, promotable lieutenant colonels and colonels. Okay. And then the third one is the Advanced Strategic Planning and Policy Program. This one is a uh, Chief of Staff of the Army sponsored program. Uh, which uh, is open to majors all the way through colonels and uh, is a three-year program in which uh, students uh, study for a PhD. Uh, they'll spend some time at Fort Leavenworth and then we'll uh, spend some time teaching at a, a civilian university. Oh, wow. uh, we'll earn a PhD and then we'll uh, serve at uh, Office of Secretary of Defense or an equivalent strategic assignment. Wow. So for that last program, just a little bit of fun facts. Uh, is there a specific university that students work through, or is it different universities, or what do you know about that? Um, it's various universities. Okay. Um, the uh, the selection of uh, universities really varies year to year, okay. and uh, based on uh, um, what the uh, student is also studying. Uh, so I've uh, I've known some students who have gone to uh, to Duke University. Um, others have gone uh, um, all the way out to the West Coast. Oh wow! Uh, but uh, really depends on uh, the the students and then uh, their program of study. Nice. So you're a SAMS graduate. You know, what, what was it that really interested you in the program when you were going through the, you know, the application process, like to get involved and attend the course? So I think something that really interested me about the program was just the, the quality of leaders that I saw who graduated from the program that I worked with uh, throughout my military career. Uh, so I was I was stationed in Europe uh, with 4th Infantry Division in the Mission Command element uh, where we supported uh, the European Reassurance Initiative and Atlantic Resolve. Um, this was shortly after the crisis in Crimea occurred uh, between Ukraine and Russia and uh, U.S. European Command was building its forces again on a rotational basis uh, to deter Russia from going any further into Europe. Um, so that was my first job as a major and uh, my first job at, at the division level. And from there, I worked with uh, several officers who had graduated from SAMS. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the first ones I met was uh, an officer named Jacob Dupleski. Uh, he's a uh, um, lieutenant colonel, uh, took command of uh, 410 CAV uh, with 4th Infantry Division. Uh, but um, he, it, he was more than just a planner. Uh, he was uh, also a, a very driven leader. Um, he knew how to assemble a team and inspire mm. and motivate his peers uh, to take action and to uh, develop division level plans. And that really played out as we started mm. bringing more units into Europe. Um, from there, I met more and more uh, SAMS grads, uh, both in the regular army and the National Guard. And I was just very impressed by 
not only their planning and intelligence abilities, but also uh, just their their skills as a leader and their leadership totally. styles. Now, you know, what would you say then was like the selling point, you know, coming out of it? Like, you know, what's the selling point for why I, you know, as a mid-level captain, you know, eventually will get to that major level, hopefully, like, you know, why should I be interested in attending SAMS? Like, what's the the value add um, for soldiers coming out of the program from your point of view? I think the value add overall is the, it gives you a broader context of just the, the operations that the U.S. military uh, participates in okay. as part of, uh, you know, not just, you know, the national defense uh, enterprise, uh, but just like with uh, with the political piece, with uh, the national, the economic piece as well, it just gives you a broader context of the profession, uh, and then uh, just the the quality of people that you work with. Uh, the you know every Sam's grad who I've worked with is just uh, they're just solid leaders and solid mm -hmm. officers, and uh, having having that network of professionals in which you can always call to uh, if you need help, if you need support, uh, and if you're working on a mission. Um, you always have that network accessible to you through SAMS. Um, so just the, the depth of knowledge and then just the broader context that you earn uh, or that you develop uh, through the education there um, is a huge selling point, I think. So you mentioned ILE, after ILE or after CGSC. Um, when should an officer like look to start putting their packet together? You know, is it really pretty competitive to get into SAMS? What does that look like? I will say it's very competitive, okay. very competitive to get into SAMS. Um, on an annual basis, you'll see anywhere from 400 candidates across not just the Army, but from uh, the other services, okay. as well as some of the international militaries, and then uh, some interagency partners will apply to SAMS. And the number of seats is all based on uh, the what the Army can pay for, really. Okay. Um, so the, the, the school has grown in size uh, since it first started. Um, it's been as big as 144. Uh, students. Uh, now it's scaled back a little bit to uh, just under 100 seats now, uh, but uh, the, the, the competitive, uh, the, the population that competes for those seats is, uh, is really at the top of their game from whatever organization they come from. Um, you're talking about uh, officers and uh, leaders who you know, have been uh, the top performers in their units. Uh, they've had uh, the key developmental positions throughout their careers, and they're uh, looked at by senior leaders mm -hmm. as uh, as the hard chargers, um, so that's really what makes it very competitive. Um, so it's and it's not just uh, intelligence space. It's not just how much you know. It's also how well you work with others, mm. um, how connected you are, and uh, um, physical fitness is also a part of it as well. Because as uh, you get get through SAMS and you graduate and then go on to your utilization tour assignment, um, you will be expected to to also. Uh, be able to lead those soldiers uh, not only at the operational level but the tactical level later on in your career. So you just mentioned something on about like utilization assignment. Um, it, can you expound on that? So after SAMS, you have a utilization tour, or what does that look like? Yeah. So uh, when you graduate from SAMS, uh, you you are required to complete a uh, utilization assignment uh, to really essentially apply what you've learned through the course um, at the operational level. Okay. Um, and uh, for uh, for most officers in the Army, uh, that that uh, will require a, a utilization at a uh, division level staff. Okay. Um, so division staff position, um, usually in their plan shop at the G five. Is that like a one year tour or a two year tour? Or what is that? Um, it's typically one year long. Okay. Um, it can be up to two years long based on uh, uh, whatever your career situation is. Uh, but typically, it's one year long, and the preferred route is uh, at a uh, at the a division staff. Or a core level staff. Um, some officers also serve at uh, Army Service Component Commands, um, and then other officers also serve at uh, Army Commands, such as Force Com or Trade Off. Uh, but uh, the 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 intent of the utilization tour is to apply what you've learned in your education and your skills um, at the operational level. And what kind of assignments are those typically? Is I mean, is that in the plan section, like G five type work, or what? Um, yes, yeah, typically they are in the plan section um, of the staff. So, for example, for me, I served in the 36th Infantry Division uh, with the Texas National Guard okay. in Operation Spartan Shield as the Deputy G5. Uh, so I was uh, the strategic planner um, in that five shop with uh, one of my colleagues, Lieutenant Colonel Colleen Shepard, who's also uh, oh, wow. in, in my class uh, at SAMS. Uh, she graduated uh, same year 
and is now currently commanding the headquarters battalion here at uh, Temple Army National Guard Readiness Center. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, um, so we deployed uh, together uh, and served a utilization tour with 36 ID, uh, leading uh, the Spartan Shield mission there. And that was unique because uh, we were we were directly embedded with the Theater Army, uh, Third Army, U.S. Army Central, uh, who controlled the uh, command and controlled the Army forces in the Middle East. Hmm. And in a lot of times, our division headquarters had to do a lot of things at the at the theater army level, which we didn't train for prior. But we had to. We were in the position. We were in the the area of responsibility, and we needed to uh, form plans and make and execute those plans. And 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 how do you feel like Sam's prepared you for taking on that kind of unique role? So I think Sam's prepared me in that it. Uh, you know, back to the the idea of context and understanding the broader picture, Sam's really helped me to understand what was going on across the entire theater of operations. Um, you know, prior to prior to working in that position, a lot of the a lot of the different duty assignments I had were very much focused on, you know, very specific tactical missions. Mm. You know, I uh, you know, I, I was I've been a logistician for most of my career. And so a lot of my uh, my missions that I, I conducted with those units were very focused on, you know, um, uh, set timelines with set sets of tactical mission tasks. Uh, whereas this was very much, you know, broad and open ended, and uh, we really had to understand the operational level plans, uh, the operational campaign plans, and even the national level strategy to understand what senior leaders at the national level, the strategic level, and the operational level wanted to achieve in the in the middle east and we were the the unit of employment to execute those actions there one of the most challenging experiences that i had uh, was right before i left um, involved the uh the withdrawal of uh civilians from afghanistan oh, really? um, so this was uh this was at the time that was building up uh, to when u.s forces were withdrawing completely from afghanistan so you were, you were right in the thick of that i i was yes yeah um i didn't uh I was not directly involved with the the actual flights of uh, civilians out of Afghanistan, so the okay. actual withdrawal piece, um, as it started to really uh, um, to really climax uh, in in the August timeframe. But I did uh, I was part of the planning group that laid a lot of the foundation for receiving those hmm. uh, those uh, Afghan civilians um, in in Qatar as well as uh, in Kuwait and other places. Really, so you know, kind of. You know, you had some really unique experiences coming out of Sam's. So, like, backtrack it a little bit. Um, I, I think we might have touched on this briefly, but you were saying, like, about what point in time in an officer's career do they need to get their packet together if they're interested in it going? And then I kind of want to talk about, like, what Sam's looks like um, throughout the program. But you know, when when you said that was post-ILE, but do you, are you applying for that as you're going into ILE or CGSE, or are you doing that afterwards, or what does that look, look like here typically? So my best recommendation for preparing for SAMS is to uh, is really to begin um, even before you become a major. Okay. Um, so the 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 target period to to really start your preparation is uh, when you've completed your captain's career course, and preferably when you've uh, uh, after you've completed company command or a, a an equivalent key developmental assignment in your branch. Um, that's the best time to really. Uh, Get your feet under you and uh, um, start studying some of the uh, the higher level tactical and operational doctrine, which you'll be expected to know as you apply to SAMS. Uh, so, as a senior captain, um, start forming your plan for what you what you intend to do for your intermediate level education. Whether you go to resident CGSOC or you decide to do satellite or distance learning, and then from there you'll also be uh, laying the groundwork for preparing for SAMS. Okay. Um, so the uh, the application process uh, will take place takes place each year on an annual basis, and uh, the announcement will come out uh, usually July of each calendar year for the next academic year. Okay. Um, so the next the it's next, about twelve months out ish. Right. Yeah. So uh, so you'll get the so Human Resources Command will publish the MILPER message on the HRC website. That will have the instructions for applying to the next academic year. So the next one will be uh, the next mil per message, which should be released by July of 2022, and then that will have the instructions for applying for academic year 23. Uh, so the window for applying for National Guardsmen uh, specifically is around August and September. Uh, that's when uh, 
you'll submit your your application on the uh, U.S. Army Combined Arms Center website, okay. and then from there you'll get uh, uh, you'll get a slot for uh, for the standardized test that you'll have to take. Uh, the, the test includes uh, some sections on history, uh, joint and army doctrine, geograph geography, geopolitics, uh, some uh, some current events, some uh, tactical symbology, and then there's going to be an essay requirement in there as well. So, do you have any recommendations for prepping for that exam? Yes, my uh, so I would recommend to prep for the exam. Um, start with studying the uh, foundational army doctrine. Okay. Um, so that starts with uh, army doctrinal publication number one, which is the army, and then from there move on to ADP 3-0, uh, which is operations. Uh, from there, then move over to the uh, the corresponding field manuals. Um, so which uh, so if ADP uh, the corresponding one would be uh, um, FM 3-0, which is which is okay. also operations. Um, so start with the doctrine, and then. Uh, and then from there, move on to the, the ones that are specific to your branch, um, whether you be uh, um, field artillery or logistics. There's uh, are the is the test specific to your branch, or how does that work? No, the test is uh, it really covers uh, the the capstone doctrine, which is uh, ADP 3.0 operations. Okay. Um, so the bulk of the questions will reference things that uh, that you will be expected to know uh, going into SAMS. Um, uh, at the start of the course. So then you mentioned the application pool then. So like you're putting your application, you go through this exam, you said maybe 400 people. Is, is, that, is that just open? Like they take the top 100 folks, whether it's guard or reserve or active component, or is it built out by, you know, the guard gets so many quotas or, you know, for a guardsman, what, you know, what are they looking like? So the, the uh, senior leadership of SAMS uh, will tell you that there is no quota. Uh, for uh, okay for the for for the entire for the admissions into SAMS, <coughs> um, so with that what that means is that really they are selecting the uh, the the best performers and the ones who will make the uh, that will compose the the best well-rounded class for that academic year. Okay, um, so that's really uh, determined by the board who who goes through the application screening process of all the candidates. And then based on that, they, they determine who the, uh, the best performers for that upcoming academic year will be. Nice. Um, so really, there is no quota for how many National Guard officers will be accepted every year. Um, it can be as little as uh, one. It can be as an A as nine. Um, I think the, that's the most that we've had in any, any oh, one wow. given year. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's really all based on the performance of that applica application uh, population and how well the, the board determines they'll work together. So then, you know, getting into SAMS itself then, right? You said 10-month program. What, what was the day-to-day -day like for you once you started that program? Or can you kind of walk us through the course a little bit? Yeah, so the, the, course, the course changes uh, really based on uh, the, who's the director at the time and then who the faculty are on the, uh, uh, at the school. Um, so my SAMS experience will be different from what uh, Lieutenant General Jensen's SAMS experience was when he went through in 2002 uh -huh. and everything in between. But generally what the curriculum consists of, it con uh, consists of some foundational theory uh, that focuses on uh, war and warfare. Um, so you'll study some classical theorists such as uh, Karl von Clausewitz or uh, Jomini, uh, Sun Tzu, and then uh, um, some other uh, classical theorists as well. You'll learn some uh, newer concepts during that time You'll also uh, do some uh, do some coursework that looks at uh, um, geographic areas and uh, um, allies and adversaries, and then you'll you'll do some historical uh, campaign studies as well, looking uh, back to the uh, Revolutionary War, oh, wow. um, all the way up to uh, the present day, and uh, study those uh, in depth as far as the the history behind them, some of the uh, the theories that underlied um, how they employed doctrine, how they executed operations. And those kind of things there. As far as a typical day at SAMS, um, it really uh, kind of depends on which block of instruction that you're in. Um, I can say that um, at the very beginning of the course, I was uh, reading a lot. Um, I would say... Uh, I was going to say, that's the only thing I've heard is like from people in SAMS saying like, oh, they show me this pile of books and I'm like every day, you know? It is, it is a lot of reading. Um, it is something that you do have to train up for. Uh, the uh, As soon as you start the course, you'll read... Uh, 
uh, a book called uh, Young Men in Fire by Norman McLean. Um, okay. He also wrote uh, River Runs Through It. Um, so that, that book is about 300 pages. Uh, but uh, most lessons will range anywhere from 150 to uh, about 250 pages per lesson. Um, so training up to uh, be able to read that much is definitely a skill that needs that you will learn uh, early on in the course. Are you uh, doing that like every day or what is that looking like? Um, typically, you'll do that uh, at least three three days a week. Uh, you'll have a, uh, a lesson uh, where you'll you'll read and prep for that lesson. And then when you get to uh, to class at 830 in the morning, you'll have discussions with your seminar uh, that will focus on the history, theory and doctrine uh, that uh, underlines what you just read and how it applies to your profession and how you'll hmm. end up using it as a planner. And then uh, from there, uh, you'll usually uh, break for the day um, around noon, and then uh, you have the rest of the afternoon to study, uh, which will include reading, which will include some writing, and then some research that you'll do for your uh, your monograph that you'll hmm. write as part of the uh, graduation requirement. And, and can you explain what that is for people who are unfamiliar? Yeah, so the monograph is a, uh, essentially it's a research paper, similar to a thesis. It's just got... Uh, a few different requirements that uh, that separate it from a, a formal thesis, but uh, <clears throat> the the purpose of the monograph is for you to <clears throat> demonstrate your ability to research a, a topic that relates back to operational art, like we, talk, like we talked about. Um, you really uh, aren't really limited on uh, on what you can on what you want to research. Really, anything that interests you that relates back to the profession of okay. arms, and then. Uh, and operations and strategy is uh, is what you can research, and that's uh, that's a year long uh, project that you'll work on in conjunction with your daily studies that you'll do as part of the course. Now, do you get is there is there academic credentials that come with graduating SAMs or, or credits towards anything? I know you mentioned one of the follow on programs is like a PhD three three year program, but for SAMs itself, you know, are there credentials that come with it or no? Yes, so everyone who graduates from the uh, Advanced Military Studies program, as well as the, uh, the senior course, will earn the uh, Master's of Arts in Military Operations. Okay. And then uh, you also earn the additional skill identifier of Six Sierra, which is Operational Planner, and that qualifies you to serve in, uh, at division staff level in the uh, plans section, as well as at combatant command levels in their, uh, their plans divisions as well. So what was like the most memorable moment for you in SAMS then? Um, was, there a, was there a moment that stuck out where you're like, ah, whether it was like a lessons learned or, or something that um, you kind of uh, found interesting? I think my, my most memorable moment in SAMS was uh, going on the staff ride uh, to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Okay. So this staff ride fo focused on uh, the, uh, the Battle of Vicksburg, uh, which involved... Uh, um, Pemberton uh, from the Confederate Army and then uh, Ulysses S. Grant and uh, the uh, Siege of Vicksburg at the time. And uh, for me, it was a great opportunity to go out outside the classroom with my seminar, um, who we all, you know, we're, we became great friends. We still keep in touch with, uh, with each other to this day and really uh, get, get to walk the land and uh, beyond just what was on the books. Um, so we got to walk in the hot weather of Mississippi and uh, get to see a lot of those, uh, those uh, stands where the uh, battles took place and be able to, uh, to relate back to what we had read in the books and see in real life this, these are how these senior leaders made their decisions in those moments. And really just the camaraderie that came with it, being able to see the town of Vicksburg yeah. and... Uh, and being able to uh, to get to know my seminar mates uh, much better was really one of my most memorable moments. So you were talking about credentialing. Um, you get the master's in military studies, and then you mentioned these other programs that that follow on SAMS. Are are those programs where like if you're a SAMS graduate, you go, you can go, you're eligible to go to the next level of programming, or is it, you know, hey, I'm a lieutenant colonel following War College, now I can apply for this program as well. How does that work? So it doesn't quite make you eligible per se. It makes you more competitive for okay. a lot of those positions there. Yeah. So, so having the six Sierra ASI um, really is most relevant to the Army um, when okay. it comes to uh, working in certain positions at the at the Army level and at the Army command level. Uh, but uh, what will really speak the most is uh, 
you know, one having having SAMs on your resume and then having uh, done a uh, solid performance um, in your utilization tour, whatever that might be. Um, so being able to perform really well as a division planner or a core level planner uh, will make you more competitive uh, as you go to compete for joint duty assignments um, or uh, or OSD level assignments as well at the Office of Secretary of Defense. Uh, those are really the things that will uh, that will set you apart from your peers there. So if I'm really wanting to be competitive going into SAMS, um, you talked about some of the preparation a little bit. Like, what are some things that I can do? Um, you know, as a mid-grade captain or even a junior major, right, to really set myself up for success as I go into this application window? What I would recommend for senior level captains who are, who are completing their career course or might be completing company command is uh, to start studying uh, for uh, their intermediate level education. Um, so um, begin studying the foundational doctrine, which includes okay. uh, um, Army Doctoral Publication One, which is the Army, and then uh, ADP 3.0, which is uh, operations. Those will be the core. That will be the core material that you will have to demonstrate your knowledge in uh, when you apply to SAMS. So start studying those things there. Start reading as well. So I would start with the uh, foundational uh, classical theorists, if you want to call it that. So okay. uh, on war, the call von Clausewitz is okay. uh, is a core uh, uh, reading that you will do at SAMS. Uh, the Art of War by Baron de Jomini is kind of uh, the antithesis to Clausewitz, uh, which, which offers a different okay. uh, opinion on war, as well as uh, Sun Tzu and then other classical theorists there. Read some military history. Uh, just get used to reading. Mm -hmm. And as you read, uh, make sure that you write down your thoughts, uh, because uh, when, you, when you read that much, you really need to compose what you just read and what, how, it makes, how it makes you think and uh, what it means to you. Uh, understand the meaning of uh, to you as an officer and to the profession is what you really have to demonstrate when you apply to SAMS and then if you do get accepted to SAMS uh, uh, how you how you will apply that uh, that education that's, that's a really interesting note is that so when you were doing a lot of your reading in SAMS you know what did you well, you know did you have any tips or tricks that you used to help you comprehend like so much information you know on an ongoing basis for 10 months so for me, one thing that helped a lot when it came to reading and writing was uh, taking notes, having a good note note taking system. Uh, so I used a combination of OneNote uh, on my my laptop uh, to make sure that I kept everything organized and could type as I uh, as I was sitting in the seminar during the discussions. Um, I could also use my notes to help me build my essays, build the outlines for the essays that I have to write because uh, you have to write multiple essays in each block in addition to your monograph. Nice. And then uh, um, just having uh, uh, a note card system as well as okay. I read through each of the books. Um, so I'd read uh, maybe a chapter at a time or 20 pages at a time, take notes on the main ideas from the chapters, and then uh, piece those things together and write kind of a summary uh, of what the, what the main ideas of those chapters were. So when you're doing these notes, do you do you take notes and highlight a lot when you read, like in the in the books themselves? Or are you doing everything external? Um, I do, yeah. I, I do take a lot of notes in the books and highlight everything. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, of hard copy books. Okay. Uh, sometimes that's not always the case, um, just based on uh, the availability of some books. Uh, but you can highlight in uh, a lot of uh, electronic apps as well, which is good. And you can also take notes that way too. But yeah, um, I definitely uh, prefer hard copy books. Uh, that way I can easily reference them and I uh, can have them open there in front of me uh, while I work on uh, essays and other writing. So you mentioned the essays we're going to write and then you mentioned the monograph. For this monograph, you said it was kind of like a thesis but not really. Um, you know, what is the size and scope of that project? So the, uh, the size and scope, really uh, the, the length of most monographs um, ranges anywhere from... Uh, I'd say uh, you know sixty to eighty pages, okay. um, you know ten thousand words at least. Uh, the The scope really depends on what topic you're researching. Um, you can have a very focused research topic that looks at a, a very uh, short period of time um, in a given campaign or a given event, or you can broaden that uh, that scope to look at uh, an entire conflict as well and compare it to other conflicts. Uh, but uh, really, it depends on your comfort level with researching, um, as well as uh, what is feasible 
to that research topic. The good thing is you'll have a PhD who is, who is going to be assigned to you, who will be your, uh, your monograph chair. Okay. Uh, that PhD will help guide you through the research proce process and will help edit your papers as you go along and, uh, and help, you, help set you up for success. And uh, they will also, and if you have no idea what you want to research, they uh, have a lot of ideas that they can give you that might be of interest to them and might be of interest to you as well. Yeah, what was your, what was your project on, if you don't mind me asking? So I researched reconstitution operations among multinational divisions. So, okay. yeah, so this, this was a, uh, a case study that I, a comparative case study that I did using uh, two different uh, task forces uh, one from World War One, the other from uh, World War II. Uh, so the okay. first case study looked at uh, the uh, the 93rd Division, which was uh, which was an all black division uh, during World War One. It was one of two all black divisions uh, during the First World War, and uh, they were aligned with the French Army, and uh, they helped to reconstitute uh, uh, several of the French divisions really? uh, by embedding directly with. Uh, with those uh, formations there, and uh, they they really uh, were able to <clears throat> to um, integrate very well, just based on uh, you know um, language commonalities, culture, and then uh, interoperability of mm. uh, systems and training and those kinds of things. There, uh, the second case study I looked at was uh, the Burma campaign, which involved uh, Merrill's Marauders, mm -hmm. which was the 5307th uh, Composite Unit. Um, which eventually became the Mars Task Force. Um, that unit was constituted using a uh, um, National Guard unit, actually the 124th Cavalry Regiment, um, as well as uh, um, a uh, regiment from the Chinese Army, uh, and and then uh, a group of guerrilla fighters uh, from Burma. Um, so, creating this multinational task force um, reconstituted uh, to be able to continue the fight is what I looked at um, from a tactical lens, and what it where I kind of also researched was, you know, what what decisions were made at the senior le senior leader level that enabled that reconstitution operation to happen. So one of the other things that was kind of you we had talked about before we started the podcast here, um, and I wanted to bring in everyone else in on was the preparatory program um, that the National Guard is doing now. Can you kind of explain what that is? Um, you know, at what point does that take place, and how does that function as a lead into SAMS? So the preparatory program was started uh, around 2017. Okay. Um, it was uh, started uh, by a handful of uh, Title 32 National Guardsmen, as well as uh, a couple of uh, Title 10 AGR Guardsmen as well. And uh, <clears throat> what this uh, what this seminar focused on was uh, preparing National Guard officers for the application process to SAMS. <coughs> um, so the Originally, it was uh, it was held at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, on site at uh, the Command General Staff College, and uh, it included uh, an overview of the school, uh, which was uh, given by the SAMS faculty, okay, as well as uh, some uh, senior leader remarks uh, from uh, from some uh, from general officers in the National Guard. Um, this this included Major General James Taylor, who was the first Army National Guard SAMS graduate uh, in 2000 as well as Lieutenant General Jensen, uh, current uh, director of the Army National Guard. Uh, so getting their involvement and their support was definitely helpful for the, the program to not only spread the word, but also get uh, senior leaders and uh, um, senior, senior raiders to support their best performers to apply to the school. Mm. But the, what the seminar includes right now is, uh, is in addition to an overview of the school, it includes preparation for the standardized test, uh, which includes uh, the multiple choice questions on history, geopolitics, and doctrine, okay. as well as the written essay that's part of that test there. Uh, we also go over some preparation and some tips for uh, doing well in the interview, because uh, uh, part, part of the application includes an interview with the SAMS faculty, um, so they can kind of feel out how, uh, mm. how well you'll perform uh, in, uh, in your seminar, um, as well as the... Uh, and it also includes uh, some tip, some tips for talking with uh, your your rating chain to include your rater and your senior rater and your chain of command on how they can write uh, a solid uh, uh, letter of recommendation for you. Um, the 
the responsibilities uh, from the rating chain include one, making sure that your OERs are submitted on time and, uh, and, and accurately recognize your performance and your potential for success. And then the, uh, the supervisor layer of recommendation uh, provides a snapshot to the SAMS faculty of how you're performing right now and what your potential for be for success at the hmm. school. So, so how long is this? Is the prep seminar? The prep seminar is usually two to three days. Okay, so it's and who's who's able to attend? Is it just the people that are interested? Do you have to be selected, or how does that work? So the seminar is open to all captains and majors across oh, really? the Army National Guard. Doesn't matter your uh, your ILE completion status. You don't even have to be enrolled in ILE at the time, uh, but. Uh, um, if you're a captain or a major and you want to go to SAMS, you are welcome to attend. Really? Um, you just uh, you just register through your state G3, uh, and uh, we put out guidance uh, each year, um, at least twice a year, with the application instructions. Uh, and where does that guidance typically go? So the guidance is published in the base order guidance uh, put out from uh, Army National Guard G3, okay, uh, which includes uh, instructions uh, for applying as well as uh, some instructions uh, for what will qualify you to apply to the actual school. Uh, but uh, as far as attending the prep seminar, really you just have to be motivated and you have to want to have an interest and intent to apply to SAMS. Nice. So, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about SAMS, right? We talked some about now the prep program to help get um, National Guardsmen into SAMS. Um, a little bit about your experience, some of the you know, unique opportunities you had fo right directly following SAMS and your utilization tour. You know, I guess, do you have any, you know, last thoughts or pieces of advice you'd like to give for, you know, those listening that are interested in potentially, uh, you know, going down the same path that you, you already went? Yeah, so my advice to everyone who's listening is always have a never quit attitude. Um, throughout the entire process, uh, whether you're applying to SAMS or thinking about applying to SAMS, or even as you're going throughout your military career, always have an attitude of I will never quit. Uh, because the honest truth with SAMS is that it is a very competitive school. It is very hard to get into. And, and as uh, the class size uh, shrinks from what it used to be, um, there are less seats overall, which makes it that much more competitive. And the, the peers that you will compete against in order to get in the school are just as motivated as you, if not more. And uh, they might know things that you don't. But at the same time, you might know things that they don't but you have to be able to work together and you have to be able to apply your knowledge and demonstrate what you've learned in order to be successful. So always have a never quit attitude throughout the entire uh, process. The other part is to be humble. Okay. Uh, because uh, like I said, with uh, uh, when you get to SAMS, you will not know everything and you will not leave SAMS knowing everything either. But you will have something that, that you can offer to the group that someone else in the group or others in the group do not know or they, they need in order to make them themselves better as well in order to make the collective group uh, successful. So uh, be humble, uh, be honest with yourself as far as uh, what you do know and what you don't know. Uh, understand uh, what you need to do to prepare. Um, have the conversation with your raider and your senior raider. Uh, always stay in touch with your chain of command and uh, make sure that you express your interest in SAMS and what you can do to make yourself better and make the organization better. Sir, thank you for joining us and sharing some of your thoughts today and experiences and uh, look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks for having me. If you would like more information on any of the topics discussed today, please visit our social media pages in the links below or search Leaders Recon on any of your favorite platforms. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.